Welcome once again into Inside LAFC Podcast. I want you to remember these podcasts because there will be a day where things don't go great for LAFC. Where maybe they're at the bottom of the table. That's not going to happen. But maybe things aren't going so great. And you're not playing in a major semifinal, preparing for a final, preparing to qualify for the CONCACAF Champions Cup a week before another semifinal. Uh, Something, what is it, 21 games. They've had one loss. Two, if you include a Vancouver Whitecaps shootout. But that's it. I mean, these are the good times. So enjoy them. Don't take them for granted. Right, Beta? Because Stephen Beta, sure, there. It's, I mean, this is something else. We're here every week. We have, I mean, we want to be critical, but we can't. We got to enjoy this. Embrace it. Uh, you know, it's not always like this. Uh, the sun is shining. The, the flowers are blooming. It's beautiful, right? So enjoy it. You sound like Bob Ross. So <laughs> sometimes uh, things don't go your way right now things are going your way and it's funny the different circles that i'm in from past teams i talk to past players or past coaches and everyone's just like man lafc they're a beast man they're rolling they're rolling on teams firing on cylinders so they got to keep it going just blowing people out we are recording this before the semifinal game against the rapids so bear with us we uh, we don't know the result yet. We're assuming the way things are going, they're going to win that game and move on. I hope I didn't jinx it. Knock, knock on wood. So uh, we, we, we are recording this in advance. So we will talk about what we know of coming off this Sounders result, which was over at halftime. And we were talking beta last week. Remember, we said, which which would you prefer? Which If we could only pick one, beating the Sounders at their place in the League's Cup quarterfinals, or beating them up in uh, Seattle in the semifinals of the Open Cup. I'm starting to think they're going to win both of them because the Sounders have no idea how to play LAFC. It's funny, when when I was watching the first half and I started thinking back to our conversation here last week, and I'm like, it doesn't look like they're struggling at all. They're just going to win both games. I'm confident yeah. now. Before, you're like, oh, okay. You, you know, let's play the odds a little bit. <laughs> you're not going to take them all. You'll take one here, one there. They're going to take both. They're going to take every single time they go up there. They look that dominant um, and that good. So, yeah, I, I don't think you're you're jinxing it. They're they're rolling right now. Let's just keep it going. As uh, the famous quote says, "Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, you're not fooling me, LAFC. I ain't taking that bait anymore." We have a great show for you. We of course have Beta. We have a very special guest making his debut. This past weekend, we will tell you how Lewis O'Brien did. He will be joining us to show on the second half of Inside LAFC podcast. We want we have some homework we do want to share with you. I think everyone knows that the Open Cup semifinal was moved a, a day later. So for those fans that are going up there, check your calendars. Make sure that is all accommodated. Games are being moved because LAFC keeps winning. The game against the Whitecaps at BC Place. Uh, which was going to be played this weekend because now you have to make way for the, the the championship game or the third place game. We don't know yet, but they're going to be playing this weekend. That has been rescheduled for October the 13th at 4.30 Pacific time at BC Place. So there's no place to put these games for LAFC anymore, really. This is it. Yeah, yeah. It's a good problem to have, right? We, we spoke about this earlier. If you get knocked out in League's Cup early, you're sitting around for a while. You kind of lost your momentum. Right now they're flying, but they have all these games. And so one of the things I love that Steve uh, Trondo is doing is he's rotating. He's getting different guys in there. He's giving different guys minutes. And guys are stepping up, but they they do have a lot of games. So they have to continue to rotate and stay fresh. You said they, we should win one trophy. I know you feel they can win more, but you said win the one trophy. Are you still comfortable in saying that or you feel like this team's going to win? It's going to win more than one. I, I think on standards, winning one is still very, very good. Now watching them and the rhythm that they're go- going through, I think they can get two. I, I don't think it's too much to ask that they get those two. Um, but, you know, this is this is a tough matchup coming up against Colorado. You know, you can't look past opponents. You can't say, hey, we're going straight into the final against Columbus, a, a little rematch against uh, MLS Cup final last year. I don't think you can think that. You have to focus on Colorado because they just knocked out some really good Mexico sides. So not once, not twice. They, three of them. They, four. they, they took out four with Club America. So they're, 
they're doing well on their own. So it's going to be a good matchup. So everybody, the League's Cup will be successful when you have MLS versus Liga MX opponents. And everyone was going crazy. Yours truly, you were with the idea that it's going to be LAFC Club America down here in Los Angeles. It would have made the local news cycle. It would have been a big story. Dude. It doesn't happen. And people are getting upset here and there. But the, the, the situation with, uh, with the Liga MX teams, we can blame the Rapids for that. <laughs> they took them they, out. They, they screwed it up for everyone. Debate the only team the Rapids uh, lost to <laughs> was at Portland. Uh, you know, it was it was the first game, and they got it handed to them for nothing at Portland. But after that, you know, they played four straight Mexican clubs in a row and beat every single one. So um, you know, maybe maybe they don't want to see an MLS team now. Maybe they kind of hoped we get to see another uh, Liga MX side, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're doing well. You can blame it the Raptors for popping all those teams. <laughs> it should have been Club America versus Toluca in the quarterfinals, and LAFC played the winner, but it's not. Give credit to the Rapids. They're a very dangerous team. This is a different format. You're probably going to know the result after we're talking about this, so we will move on. To the yeah. black and gold standard, there you see it. And the black and gold standard can be many things. But one thing it certainly is, Beta, whether it's a CONCACAF Champions Cup, whether it's the Open Cup, whether it's the League's Cup, this is their second year in it. They made a quarterfinal and they made a semifinal. Whether it's MLS Cup playoffs, with maybe one exception, that when they are in a tournament, they make a run. We, we, winning the tournament is the hardest part. And the last year after MLS Cup, they the last couple of years haven't been able to do it. They hope to alleviate that this year. But there's something to be said for a team that we know. We were sitting there at the beginning. Are they going to have any problems? We fought maybe, but they don't. They here they go, and it's usually not just winning a game; or it's it's making it deep into a tournament. Here they are again, and that is the black and gold standard, amongst many other things. For for such a short history, you know, 2018, uh, the first year for LAFC to now to already have that expectation and that standard of excellence and winning, it's impressive. You have to give credit to, to the ownership group, to management. They did a phenomenal job. You know, the coaching staff comes in, even when Bob was here, does a phenomenal job. Now Steve Trondlo takes over and continues that that just that standard of winning, right? Black and gold. Gold. You think you won. You got to win. And so they're continuing to do that every tournament. They're making deep runs. They're either winning it or going far. And not many clubs can say that, and they've been in this league for a long time. So it's very cool, and it's it's fun to watch. It was fun to be a part of when I played, and it's still fun to watch because, you know, it's tough to, to have that standard and continue to do it. What does that do for a, a team internally? What does it do for opponents to see that, to know, let's say from a, a Colorado Rapids perspective or whoever they face, when you face a team in a tournament, you go, oh, it's those guys. They all uh, – you know, if you're a player, you have a bit of arrogance to you because you're confident, right? You're like, yeah, we are going to win home. <laughs> We're going on the road. Yeah, we are going to win on the road. You know, I played about 14 years in the league, and I think only two years that I had that just mentality of, yeah, we're winning on the road. We're for sure winning at home, but we're also going to win on the road. Many teams just think, let's just try to take a point here. And that 2019 LAFC team, it didn't matter if we were home or away. We were, we were going in. We're going to win. So you, as, as a player on that team, confident, right? Now, as an opponent, I've had games against LAFC. And it's like, man, you have a, they have a target on their back anytime you're playing LAFC. Because you know it's such a good team that you're about to play. You know, you can't make mistakes. You have to be sharp. You have to be focused. And you have to do everything right. Otherwise, you'll get punished. You'll lose. Game over. Two, three, nothing. And so that's kind of the expectation when you're on the team and when you're against them and you're playing against LAFC. And I think everyone can agree around the league. That's kind of what you expect when LAFC comes to town or when you go into their place. We will talk about the evolution of this team. We have an interesting quote from Steve Trinillo that we will share and break down which feeds into the black and gold standard. That'll be coming up here shortly. I think with regards to tournaments, this league's cup run, and we'll see how it ends, but up till these semifinals, uh, this is right up there um, 
with just the dominant effect, 14 goals scored, three goals against. Two of those goals happened in a 10-minute span against the Whitecaps. So they had a bad 15 minutes. I think that's it. Yeah. These games, San Jose, they took care of. Cholos, Tijuana took care of clean, took care of the Sounders. I mean, I mean, I, I, one of my one of the lasting impressions of this tournament is the look on Brian Schmetzer's face. The Sounders were playing great. They were hyped. This was all right. We're going to get up. He looked like uh, like he came down with a Christmas tree and there was nothing under it. It was just a dis huge disappointment. And like, like I tried. I can't get over these guys. This League's Cup run to me. Right up there. Yeah, it's impressive when you st state those stats. And uh, Brian's face, I remember on the, on the TV, I think it was after the third goal of FC scored. And he's just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do. These guys. Playing, he's like playing with yeah. the socks. He's like, he's like kind of looking at his paper. I'm like, I don't know. There's no more sides to this. What else do I do? Oh, man. And I think a lot of teams are doing the same thing. Uh, it's it's tough, man. It's tough. LAFC is flying. They are absolutely firing on all cylinders. So and we, Brian Schmetzer is a wonderful man. I feel bad, except, hey, sorry, Brian. This, there's yeah. no room for both of the clubs, so they move over. But yeah. you'll see, he'll see if he can pick up the pieces in the uh, U.S. Open Cup. Did mm -hmm. want to clear everything up because we know all these competitions. I was on Fox 11 and Alex Michelson says, I don't know the difference between all these tournaments. We get it. It's pretty overwhelming. But we wanted to get to the stakes to the League's Cup what, what, what is at stake here? And by making the semifinals, that quarterfinal win was the big one because LAFC now gets two shots at the CONCACAF Champions Cup. If they go on to win League's Cup, they go into the groups uh, without having to qualify. There's a different qualification metric if they make the final and lose. If you, if you lose in the semifinals and you get into the third place game, uh, you play that third place game against whomever it is and whoever wins that game. This is what makes this third place game a little better. You will go to the CONCACAF Champions Cup as well. And that's a tournament that LAFC missed last year and they don't want to miss again. So the, the, the law of averages suggest that they will probably make it in there. I spoke to some folks at the league and this is still CONCACAF kind of holds the strings on this competition. But there is a bid for the Club World Cup next year, which would be huge. Lots of money. You get to play against Real Madrid and Manchester City. They're all in that tournament. And that is not necessarily up for grabs. It may still be. That is still in discussion. They wanted to make sure an MLS team won it because there's a there's a bid for a host team in the uh, in the Club World Cup. So it's going to an MLS team. So you got four MLS teams in the semifinals. It makes sense. Maybe they want to give it to the winner of the 2024 MLS Cup. So this is going to come out, but we don't know that yet. So there is incentive to go and win this tournament and win and get into the Club World Cup. And next summer, it's all there in front of you. More games for, for LFC. You win the first ever League's Cup trophy. You get some money for the players in the club. That's all good. But uh, as, as, as prizes go, that's... If, if there's somehow that connected with the uh, Club World Cup, that's pretty significant. But in the meantime, we can look at just getting back to the CONCACAF Champions Cup is great for LAFC after they missed it. It's a lot of stuff that you, you just throw into the fans right there. A lot of details. But again, just to reiterate, it's a tournament. It's an opportunity for a trophy. Anytime you can hold a trophy, I don't care what the significance of that trophy is. The players want it. The fans want it. The organization wants it. Now, when you win these trophies, you get into the next thing, right? And that's that's a great thing to to get to. That's what you want to play. You want to play in Champions League. You want to, you know, you want to win all these trophies. You want to have more games. Uh, these are good problems to have when you have more games and you have to rotate and figure out, you know, what are you going to do? Who are you going to play? And all these things. Uh, but it's it's something that the players, you know, there's big bonuses involved. Obviously, you want to win. You want to have that reputation that we won the most trophies ever. You know, still to this day in 2017, I can say I was part of the only trouble winning team in MLS history. Like guys want to be able to to say that. Well, you got to handle your business and they're they're getting close. So they got to keep winning these tournaments. And only one team's ever won a League's Cup. It was Inter Miami and Messi. So you get to put your name on a, a fresh trophy with all, not all that engraving on it. Clean. Exactly. 
Clean, clean. <laughs> and look, it's it's it, we'll see what happens with Liga MX. Uh, you know, people are going maybe. You know, they had the stakes against them. It. I, I I covered a lot of games and I spoke to a lot of players and coaches. They were all in. And I saw the Club America goalkeeper in tears afterwards. I saw yeah. Monterey fire their coach after they got knocked out. So I'm not having that. Uh, Liga MX Liga MX has got to bring it next year. Yeah, yeah, they got to bring it. I think they brought it. They tried. Look, they were emotionally yeah. invested, but MLS team showed up. Denny Bawanga, he is uh, unequivocally a League's Cup legend, dominance in the League's Cup. Let's call him Mr. League's Cup. We'll give him a top hat and a cane, and he can go, I'm Mr. League's Cup. This is uh, pretty impressive. So he scored again. He has played in eight games, now has 17 goal contributions. He got his 11th goal. <laughs> I mean, we didn't even talk about the Hugo Loris assist. That is just unworldly, and he has six assists. So he now has more goals than Lionel Messi in League's Cup history. This is, he's good in everything. And we remember the CONCACAF Champions League when it was called that. He was getting hat tricks and tons of goals there in MLS Cup. But this is, this is insane. So many other guys, you know, Kike Oliveira's had a big tournament. Uh, others have chipped in, uh, Matty Bogush, but set 11 and six and scoring really nice goals at that. Still with a perfect penalty record too, to boot. Uh, Denny Buwanga, uh, I, I can't imagine this. He is the poster boy. You know, MLS is scrambling because they don't have these Liga Emekis teams, but they have a super club in LAFC, and they have their guy. With all the stars, Danny Buanga is a cut above. For me, he does it all. He is worth every single penny. <laughs> he's entertaining. He's fun. He's fast. He's dynamic. He can dribble. He can beat you with speed. He'll slow you down, cut inside. He'll slow you down, go outside. He'll cross it. He'll shoot it. Man, this guy does it all. It's so fun to watch. I'm thankful that I don't have to deal with that as an outside back because he would just give me nightmares. How would you? Uh, how do you defend that guy? Because people, man, Seattle didn't do it the right way. They can't. Yeah. I don't know what they were. Do you give him you know, a cushion? I I loved watching game film on guys beforehand before I played, and with him, he just does so many things so well. That I don't know if there's a real answer for you. Usually I watch game film and I see what their tendencies are. And then I try to make them do the opposite. Or I try to prevent them from doing that. Either you get tight quickly or you just force them one way. Some guys just don't like going down the line onto their weak foot. This guy has no problem. He'll he'll dribble, 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 chop down the line, cross it in. And Bogus is over here tapping in. Or Kai's over here getting on the end of things. So you don't want that either. So I, I I don't know what kind of advice to give these guys because he is that good. I maybe just foul him high up the field <laughs> and let everybody get back. So you just have numbers behind the ball. There's, it's not bad really, idea, man. there's, there's no real good way to stop him. He's that good. Hugo Lloris and Olivier Giroud probably didn't encounter him much when they were all playing in France. He was playing for San Etienne, which did get promoted again, by the way. So good news for his former club, but I mean, that goal, like, Hugo Lloris looked like an NFL punter. I mean, he looked like he played for the Seahawks. He positional kicked it, knowing that Buanga could get on the end of it. I mean, you don't, I mean, you don't see goals like that. You, you blame the Sounders, but they got away with it. Two assists for Lloris already. This is uh, not bad for any position. Goalkeeper, two assists. Let's see how many he can get. He'll keep it going. <laughs> okay, some players uh, continue to immerse in the team. And Olivier Giroud... Uh, 26 minutes, his second game still looks like he is, you know, figuring out where, where his tendencies should be, where his teammates tendencies, I'll leave it to you. I mean, it's a small sample size. It's very difficult. There was one play, I think it was in the 83rd minute where Lewis O'Brien, who we'll talk about made this run and he was heading to the left and Giroud was between the center backs open. And it was like, if it was there, Giroud gets his first goal. It didn't happen, but the positional thing, you see some things. How have you seen what Olivier Giroud has been able to do in a difficult situation playing for a team that doesn't need you right now? They don't. They're doing very well without getting into that uh, into the uh, the bloodstream. I think he's still getting his bearings under him. He we, we talked about what a long season he had last year. And so he probably did take a little bit of family time, a little bit of uh, mental and physical break the last few weeks before he started training again. But 
I'm going to say this. I said this before. I'll say it again. Game fit is different than, you know, training fitness or just being fit. Game fit, you, you, you can only replicate it with actual games. So now he's had two very small sample sizes. I think what 15 and 25 minutes. I don't think he had a shot on shot on goal or shot last game. You know, he had some good passes. I think he was hundred percent on his, his passes, but you know, when you have a striker like that, he needs some service. He needs some shots. He needs to get on the end of things. And that'll just come with, with time with the players being familiar with what they what they like to do, how they like to cross it. Are they guys that put it in the air, guys who cut it back, guys who put it in behind the, the back line? He'll figure all that stuff out, but it'll take time, and this is good for him, right? Each each game he'll get more and more minutes, and we'll start seeing the Olivier Giroud that we all know and love. We should also mention he's not been in a situation where he's had to chase a goal. They were down three goals, or they were up yeah. three goals, oh, so they could just – they were up three goals. You know, they're not going to push their opponent. Both games, so. both games right? Both games. Yeah. They were right. Yeah. So, what, what do you want him to do? You're not going to keep pinging the ball around. The opponent yeah. is. So he's going to be he's going to be a lower block. So yeah. it is what it is. Did you see the footage of them at the AVP in her, in in uh, it was on social media with him and Hollingshead and Kai Kamara hitting some volleyballs around down in Manhattan Beach? I didn't see that. I didn't. Was it good? <laughs> Olivier Giroud. I think made a great choice. He looks like he's really enjoying life in Los Angeles. And I think he's calling his buddies going, dude, you guys, you blew it. You guys should have come here ages ago. This is amazing. Universal yeah. Studios one day. Manhattan Beach AVP opened. Great restaurants. Who knows? Hanging out at Giorgio Chiellini's Beverly Hills Hangouts. It's a great place. Yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty cool. So we will, uh, we, will we will continue on from there. So let's take a look at Lewis O'Brien. Uh, Lewis O'Brien is uh, came in. He played 25 minutes. He was a little more active, so he was popping around there. And we saw Eduard Atuesta come off on a stretcher. We don't know about uh, the condition there, but uh, we'll we'll see. But Atuesta has played well. But if in the case he's not 100, um, Lewis and Timothy Tillman still recuperating. We, we see him training hard to get back. Lewis O'Brien looks like a guy who could give you a lot in that midfield as well. More depth for a team that's developed a ton of depth yeah i think we we heard john thorrington mention that that midfield was where he's going to try to bring a little bit more depth and i think uh o'brien is one of those guys that you saw it perfectly you know he came on same time as rude 25 ish 26 minutes um hopefully nothing serious with the twesta but it just shows you that you know having your guys available and healthy and fit is the most important thing because, you know, Tillman's still coming back from injury. And now if it's twice, he'll, um, he'll be back soon. Right. But hopefully no setbacks. You never know. Anytime someone gets hurt, you have to be cautious. You have to be careful. So it's, it's good. It's good that the team is doing well because now the coaching staff can afford being patient, you know, give these other guys, chances because you're doing well you're not chasing results you're not chasing a position in the standings because you're doing so well um but th this is why it's good what john thorrington is doing i know we're we're doing well we're in first place and th you know results are going great but it always it's good to have depth come in and and people again fighting for positions you always want that camaraderie you want that togetherness and i think they have that but it's always good to have this depth in case an injury happens you know, we don't know. Let's let's see what happens. But but I think uh, it's a good first sign for him. Well, let me talk about Steve Jordan alone when he said after the game, I'm going to read you the quote and it's about the evolution of the team. And he said this. There certainly is an evolution in this group. We had a mediocre start to the season, you know, away from home, very poor performances and results. We remember that they couldn't get a win away. But what we talked about in that phase they were all self-induced, and we knew we had the tools and to fix the problem, and the guys did. We worked hard, we were clear with them, and they were very clear with their solutions. It's an okay problem to have as long as you have the solutions to fix it in the locker room, and we do. We talk about that a lot. We're in control of our own destiny, and that is a luxury, certainly. But the players understand the work they have to put into it, play like they did tonight or other good nights, and it's not automatic. It comes from work and training, it comes from dedication, it comes from teamwork, comes from guys checking their egos at the door and making sure that LAFC is successful and not the individual. It's a pretty meaty quote, but I think there's a lot there. This team, whatever they want to achieve, it's there. We go back to 
April and March, April, they couldn't win on the road. They can't lose on the road now. They can't. Back to back wins in Seattle as it goes on. They got to keep locked in. But th- what did you think of a messaging like that, knowing the players have it? But you can't stray from that. But if you do the work, you'll get there. Spot on. 100% spot on everything that he said in that quote. And it's it's a confidence builder for the guys. They know that they're that good. They know that they, they control their own destiny. Come put in the work. Come into training every day with a smile on the face and ready to work and grind and fight and battle and realize that it's not about yourself. Yeah, you might not play this game. You might not play the next game. But LAFC, right? That's the, the objective. That's the goal for the team, not about yourself. Everyone does a little bit to help the team win. And so everyone's bought in. And it's funny, one of the other things that we spoke about was Bawanga not scoring. Do you remember we talked about that in the beginning of the year? Yeah. Oh, Bawanga's struggling, right? He's not scoring. We said, just wait, just wait. It's once that valve breaks, it's just going to be flowing goals. And look what this guy is doing. And, you know, I'm not saying they lost games because of that, but you have to realize that when LAFC misses those chances, whether it's Bawanga or whoever else, the other team is still in it. And when they nick a goal, now they can really sit back and get compact and prevent you from getting behind or getting through, breaking lines. So that was part of their struggle at first. Now LAFC is scoring, scoring first, scoring often, and opponents can't sit back. They can't waste time. Ball goes out for a goal kick. Ball goes out for a throw They can't walk, take drink of water and you know, really frustrate LAFC. Now they're jogging. They're running to pick up the ball. Hurry, hurry. We need to catch up. We, you know, the, the, the clock is ticking. And so the, the tables have turned. It's It has turned. And it looks good for LAFC. I want to thank Michael McKnight and Sarah Takata for bringing on our, our, our LAFC team, for bringing that to our attention. It's a great quote, as you said, spot on. Leaving the mm-hmm. ego at the door. You touched on that as a team. There, there's no There's no angst. Uh, everyone plays if you put the work in. We've seen that with Kai Kamara. We thought would diminish playing time. He scores a goal against the Sounders. Maxime Cheneau playing every day, hitting balls to set up that that first or second goal. I can't remember. But it was one, yeah. All these guys that are kind of on the fringe, he said they're going to play here and there. They're all contributing. And that's that's got to be fulfilling for a player when you have this much talent. Even, even look at Eddie Segura, who I think is phenomenal. Coming off of two back-to-back years with serious – season ending injuries and they're still trying to sprinkle him in they're they're putting him into midfield you know yeah okay you're not center back in the position that you were so dominant at in 2019 and 20 but you know what you're a good player you're a good guy you have good values we're gonna still get you on get you some minutes Uh, and you know at the end of the season hopefully when you're you're raising trophies and everyone's popping champagne then we can discuss maybe a move or something or talk about your future but Eddie is such a good guy. He has such good character that he still comes on. I bet you he's coming in. He's not pouting. He's working. He's working hard. He's working for the team. So you love to see that from guys like him and Kamara and everybody. Eddie's getting minutes. Omar Campos is getting minutes. Eric Duenas, everyone's getting minutes. Uh, This is a super club, folks. Come out and see them on Wednesday night. Go to LAFC.com. Get your semi-final Leagues Cup tickets as LAFC takes on the Rapids. Let's get them to a final and let's have a magical final at our place. It, I get, it, it depends. Who, uh, we'll have to see what we play. I don't. I, I know the logistics. I know we'd have to trial for Columbus. I'd have to find out about Philadelphia, but I think we'd have to trial for them too. So anyway, it is what it is. We'll move on. Good stuff, Beta. And uh, we'll be back, I guess, to celebrate more wonderful things next week. Looking forward to it. Good seeing you, Max. <laughs> we got to test this guy's analysis with a, a loss here and there. Knock on one. We'll no, be back. No, more inside. Falcon it. flies, man. The Falcon flies. Keep flying. Well, that we can wait that for 2029, 20, 2030. Right now, we're we're just moving upwards and onwards. Inside yeah. LAFC podcast rolls on. LAFC midfielder Lewis O'Brien joins us next. Inside LAFC podcast is presented by Freeway Insurance. Driving savings. We are back here on Inside LAFC Podcast, and we are joined by new LAFC midfielder, Lewis O'Brien. Are you, and I, you made your debut against the Sounders in League's Cup, Lewis. You got the number eight. Yeah. I mean, you had to be pretty surprised that was available. 
Yeah, I mean, when I first turned up, I was I was happy to take anything that, that was up for offer. But um, luckily, the kit man, when I came in, had already printed everything up. And, and it was the number eight, which would have been my first choice. But I, I assumed it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been available, obviously, joining this late in the season. But yeah, very happy to receive that. Why would it have been your first choice? Obviously, there's a, some history there. Yeah, I mean, the number eight's kind of like the main midfielder's number, especially when you look look back to England and the way that I play, it's kind of that number eight position. You kind of put positions to numbers now, and the number eight would, would have been my, definitely been my first choice. I, I want to ask you a little bit of where you're from, but now that while I have you and you brought up the way you play, describe Lewis O'Brien, the player. What are the things you enjoy doing? What are the things that you feel you do well? Um, I'd say I'm all action midfielder. Um, it sounds strange, but I do enjoy the running and the uh, the defensive side. I quite I quite enjoy the hard graft and the uh, the side that not many players would like. So I think I fit into a lot of teams because sometimes the the front the front players don't like doing the dirty work, and I'll do that for them, and I'll I'll let them have the newspaper headlines at the at the end of the games. And but I'm happy to do all the running around you. That's interesting you say that because you, in that game, you, you were on for like 25 minutes uh, and I'm watching it on TV at home and I, there's Lewis O'Brien and, and then there you are again. You're always in the, in the camera view. So uh, a, a heavy work rate, but that's something that you enjoy and you can do yeah. for 90 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I try and read the game as well as possible. So I'll hopefully be in and around the ball all the time and help out the team as much as I can. But hopefully I can keep that work rate up for 90 minutes. The whole game, yeah. And you describe yourself as a good box-to-box -box midfielder for for the laymen who are maybe new to the sport. You know, you have the two 18-yard boxes. Everything in there you like to do, whether it's running, passing, potentially scoring, those kind of things where you could find yourself on the defensive or the offensive end. Yeah, that's probably the best description I could have gave. Yeah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's talk about Lewis O'Brien. The background. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you're from, and maybe a little bit of. Uh, Whence the, the, the hook for football soccer got into you? Yeah, so I was born in uh, Colchester, but I moved quite early up to near Manchester uh, in England. And then from probably four, I I've, I've started properly playing, um, playing football, got hooked on it straight away. And then from quite a young age, was, was in academy systems through throughout my, my young age. And at 10, ended up at Huddersfield and stayed there until I was 24 moved to Nottingham Forest in the Premier League. Unfortunately didn't go didn't go very well the way I wanted the Premier League um the Premier League dream to go, but obviously now I'm, I'm here and I'm looking forward to what I can do here. As a as a as a young man, as a young boy there growing up in England, what was your who was your club? Uh Manchester City. Manchester City. How far is uh Colchester? Is that close to Manchester? No, so Colchester's down at the bottom it's like four and oh, a half it's not hours. Even close from manchester well it's close okay. to america's americans but four and a half for us is quite far and um but i moved up there when i was like three four years old to up to manchester so yeah been been in manchester like for quite a long time i wish we could scratch that from the record i like to pride myself that i know a lot about english <laughs> uh, geography now i look like a buffoon yeah. but that's the way it is i put myself there i should have done my homework about beautiful colchester so it's seaside yeah it's near it's near there yeah <laughs> like I said, closer to you can get to the it's, United States like, quicker than Manchester. Yeah, Pro, uh, it's about the same. You can drive to Colchester in four and a half, but you can get a plane to America in seven. So it's about it's near. It's near enough. <laughs> Is it a difficult decision when you're in Manchester to pick between the two clubs? How did you know that you would go blue as opposed to red? Um, from my dad. My dad was a City fan from the the first second I came. I came. <laughs> came out and um yeah it was it was pretty the rest of the family my my dad's dad all of them are all man united fans somehow somehow we ended up in the blue half but it, it seems like a good decision after the uh the eight to ten years of heartache it's it's pretty pretty positive now <laughs> brilliant i'm gonna try and go in some chronological order here um to describe uh, uh you you touched on where you went on your career uh, yeah. and where when you were with huddersfield you were one of the the select few to play uh, what are they called the most valuable football match the championship playoff you played against yeah, nottingham so, forest which you would end yeah, up with so the most expensive football most expensive. Match in the world yeah 
what was I, that's got to, you know, getting onto the field, just to give some background, this, you, you're in the championship, the second division in England. Whoever wins this game comes to the Premier League, and it's a game changer, a life changer. What was that week like for you? No, I mean, is that is that the biggest game you you played in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the whole season leading up to that, the season prior, Huddersfield, we we just survived uh, relegation, and it was kind of set that we were probably one of the favourites to go to go down that that season, and we worked extremely hard in the off season and came back, and we had a a top group of lads and then somehow we we came third uh just missing out on the automatics and ended up getting to the playoff final which in front of i think it was eighty two thousand at wembley and yeah it was apart from obviously the the result it was probably one of the best best days of my life i remember watching that and you started and that had to be huge for the huddersfield community and uh, Again, forgive my ignorance, but were, have they been in the, the top flight? I don't know if they're in the Premier League, but have they been in that top flight historically? Yeah, so like when I was 18, so maybe four years prior to that, they, they just got promoted and they was in the Premier League for two years. I was I was out on loan at Bradford and then they unfortunately got relegated from the Premier League. But that meant that season I came back and then started my professional career playing for them. So they, they have a chance to get back, and it's so difficult to get back in the Premier League. Yeah. So it's like seize that opportunity when you get it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, I mean, you were, you were, uh, I mean, some people remember Levi Colwell was with Chelsea. He was one of your teammates on that team. Yeah. That was, a pretty, that was a pretty stacked squad that got to that final. Yeah, I mean, some of the teammates we had throughout the years, I mean, we had Emil smith Rowe, who's just recently moved to Fulham. We had, him, we had, a, we had a good front line. We had a, a solid back line. I mean, the team, when you look at it on paper, if you if you speak to other players in, in that league, they they said we were one of the most hated teams to play against because we were we were so hard to break down and we tend to just get set pieces and score from the set pieces, which was seemed to be how we worked. So that was at the end of the twenty twenty two season, correct? Yes. Was it so the tw- and you lost to Nottingham Forest. They got promoted. They're still in the Premier League. And then yeah. How did you? Did, they must. You must have done something to impress them because that was your next club. Yeah. So then I had signed for them in that that summer, um, but it turned out that I was one of like thirty five other other signings that season. It was kind of a crazy, crazy transfer window. Um, I played the first six seven Premier League games that that year. Really, really enjoyed my time there, and then didn't see much much more of the pitch, which uh, was unfortunate. Which led me to going out on loan quite a few times. Uh, just to get again some con- uh, context, I-, I remember that transfer window. I've never, you know, I follow the game pretty closely, except for where Colchester is, of course, uh, <laughs> which I now now I know, yeah. and and Huddersfield being in the Premier League. But uh, I remember they were signing players from uh, uh, the Americas, from other parts in Europe, from all over the world. So they, that was obviously the intent. They go, we're we're going to go with quality and quantity to make sure we stay up in the Premier League. Yeah, I mean, I can't say myself what what their um, their idea was to try and stay in the Premier League. It, it's obviously worked. Um, but they're still there now. It's still technically my parent club at this moment in time. So um, they're still there now, and they're, they're obviously looking looking to stay in that that league again. But for me personally, I would have liked to try and get some more game time while I was there. Sure, but you did get a taste of Premier League football. That had to be pretty pretty special uh, for a young player like yourself to. To, to to get called up to the big time, to be in the yeah, biggest I mean, league in the world. It's always your dream as a footballer when you start, especially in England, to to play at the top level and to get the chance to play. I think I played 16, 17 games in the Premier League and I scored one goal, which I, no one can ever take that away from me, that I scored a Premier League goal and got a few man of the matches when we was on Sky. And it's one of them things where I can always look back at that in my, in my career and say I've, I have played at the top level and I have competed against the top players. I think a lot of people would be quite satisfied, but not you, Lewis. 17 no. games, a goal, a couple of man of the matches. I mean, that a lot of people would strive for, but you have uh, obviously a, a lot more to look forward to. Uh, as the things didn't go to Nottingham Forest, you had some options to go on loan. You went on loan to Major League Soccer. You went to DC United. So uh, obviously that it opened the door some way for you to come up to LAFC a couple years a couple or yeah a couple years later less than a couple years later yeah 
uh, why was that the right move at the time for you? Well, I mean, at the time, it was the January transfer window for uh, England, and I basically had stuff sorted out back home, uh, ready to go, and it got to the deadline day, and it wasn't it wasn't put through in time. So I ended up not going to the, the other club on loan and was was stuck not being able to play football. And as as a person that, that thrives on playing and loves the game that much that I just want to play it all the time, I thought, the other option that I have is the MLS was still open. And luckily, uh, Wayne Rooney gave me a call and said, do you want to come play? And uh, it was one of them ones where I couldn't, I couldn't really say no. So I am um, <laughs> DC for a few months, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. I'm just thinking a young uh, English player picking up the phone and it's Wayne Rooney on the other yeah, line. It's, we uh, all know. it's strange. It was a strange one, especially as a City fan. I don't think my dad was too happy going to a... Uh, to a team that was nicknamed United, but um, yeah, it was it was a blessing in disguise, definitely. <laughs> and uh, you're not a Man United player in his heyday. There certainly is Wayne Rooney, but uh, you listened to him. And then, what did you think about uh, the level or playing in MLS? How it's helped you grow as a player? I mean, when you obviously hear a lot back in England, it's hard to watch the the game back home. It's probably three, four o'clock in the morning when when the games are being played and I think the uh, the thought of football out here is is completely different to what what it actually is. I, I came with with no no real expectation of anything. I just wanted to get back to loving football and get back to enjoying it, and um, that's what I did in the end. But the quality of some of the plays and some of the some of the games was was completely out of the ordinary to what I expected. And I think it's very end to end. Every game is counter attack, counter attack, counter attack. It's so end to end that you don't ever get a rest. Whereas when you play in the Premier League, it always seems to be one team is dominating the other team and you've got to work tactically around that. Whereas this is quite fitness based and quite quite tactical on the side of how do you stop counter attacks? And um, I seem to enjoy that because I personally take pride in my fitness side and that, that part of my game. So I really enjoyed it when I came. That's a great answer. And to be perfectly honest, Lewis, it's not one I've heard a lot in a question that we ask a lot of players who are coming from outside of North America to play in this league. But it, it, it helps your skill set. It, it kind of puts you in a situation. This is this is a good fit for me. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, to come over here and to play, I mean, some of the, the designated players that teams have are, are technically the best I've ever seen, technically better than... Premier League players in in Premier League teams, and it just so happens that they fit this kind of football perfectly, and they they are technically the best that players that I've seen. And when you go back and you tell players that, they're like, "Oh, they can't they can't be that great." And I'm like, "Well, you've never you've never played against them, and you've never seen them, so it's just one of them things." And, and now you're here with LAFC, where you get to train with Olivier Giroud and. Hugo Lloris and a, a, a wide variety of uh, top level players. Um, how was it? How, how, how did you receive? Obviously, going back to English football, but getting the news, another opportunity in MLA, MLS. How was that received? Not just to come to the league, but to play with this club. Yeah, I mean, my my thought when I went back to England was obviously to make make a name for myself back there again and kind of hit the reset button and and go from there and then. When I did come back, I said to my wife and to my parents, I was like, I don't think I'll go back unless LA ring. I said, that's the one the one place that I would like to go and to, to try. Because you see and you hear things while you're here that they're, they're one of the most dominant forces in, in MLS and that they always strive to win things and, and win everything that we're, they're involved in. And personally, in my career, I've, I've never actually won anything. I've I've been to a final and lost and I'd love to to have that feeling of winning and i think as soon as la rang it was kind of the right fit to come here and try and try and win some trophies sorry Luke, that was me lifting a trophy uh, uh, yeah. Got that. <laughs> yeah maybe i'll go like this yeah. I mean, that's, that's that's insane you arrived here you arrived here your first game is in a an international quarterfinal a, a pretty big one that's huge for major league soccer and yeah, uh, the Mexican League as well. Uh, we have a, our the Open Cup coming up. Or we'll see if you feature there as well. But to, to, what is that like to come in at the so-called business end, where you, for someone who ha who wants to get their hands on a trophy, you are going to be here with the potential to perhaps get your hands on one, two, maybe three or four at the end of of the season. 
yeah, I mean, it's the fun part, isn't it? It's the it's the bit that um, all footballers live for the the competition and the the way that we we live our lives is to train for these these big games and and to take them in our stride. I mean, when when I when I do get the opportunity to play in these games, it's like I said, it's what I live for. It's what I enjoy. I, I'll never ever take a moment like that for granted, and I'll take it all in and play to the best of my abilities every time. But like you said, coming in as my first after my visa got um, got assigned, coming in and, and the quarterfinal being my first game was was kind of a surprise, yeah. Oh, very cool. We, we had Neil McGuinness on here and he waxed poetic about you, but obviously that's a gentleman who helped um, <laughs> navigate this move. Is that safe to yeah. say? Yeah, I mean, Neil knows my agent very well and they, they got on um, from the first moment that they spoke. And I mean, I get on along with him well, but we kind of have that uh, the bond of both being from from over the over the pond, and it's easier to get along with people that have the same common interests as you. But yeah, I mean, he's a great guy, and I'm I can't uh, thank him anymore for bringing me in. And now you're at a club that's got a little bit of everything: players from all over the world. That's uh, you. The, I guess it's a, a testament to you. You blended right in with everyone. Yeah, I mean, the weather's completely different to England. I've got to say that um, it's a lot a lot hotter. I haven't seen any rain yet. Um, <laughs> But, don't hold your breath. <laughs> I don't think I'm missing it, if I'm being honest. Uh, it's quite nice to be able to wear shorts and T-shirt every day. But no, the lads the lads are great. I mean, I came in and they they accepted me into the group straight away. And you can see how family orientated this this team is and this, this whole facility is because even after games, they get the families on and the kids on the pitch. And I think that's a that's a big a big thing for, for clubs because if you if you feel like you're one big family everybody's comfortable and then everyone can can do their things to the best of their abilities not just the players uh, or coaches but the families as well that's beautiful that's a great place to leave it uh lewis and it's great that you're part of this family and enjoy the club hope you get your hands on some trophies and enjoy the city i know you have a list of things you want to do yeah Hopefully you'll be able to to hit them off check off the boxes i will do all right lewis o'brien joining us here on I oh, appreciate you, Lewis. What a lovely oh, uh, man here. Joining us here on Inside LAFC Podcast. We'll be back to recap the semifinals of the Open Cup, and we'll see if we're getting ready for what lies ahead. We might recap a final. We will see. But until then, we will join you next week. This is Max on behalf of Beta and Lewis. I will see you next time.